I am Jocelyn Bowling Dixon, the director of the Newark Public Library, and I am so delighted to see all of you this evening. And I am thrilled to be attending my first live Philip Roth lecture. Yeah, let me give that an applause, please. Yay. This is also the first Roth lecture in which we can also welcome you to visit the Philip Roth Personal Library, which is located right outside the doors of Centennial Hall. So please take a peek if you haven't seen it before. It's beautiful. Every day, whether we pass by the incredible soaring space with its wall of books or take some time to glance at the exhibits, we are reminded of Roth's astoundingly generous gift to us and to Newark. His 7,000 books and extensive memorabilia are physical reminders of Roth. His generous endowments were meant to encourage us to use our minds and imagination to keep learning and connecting. We do this through the annual Roth Lecture, other programs and services, and our Keeping It Real series of topical panel discussions that includes an upcoming academic conference called Conflicts Depicting Race and Ethnicity in Fiction, 1962 and 2021. Philip Roth, Ralph Ellison, and Pietro Di Donato it is inspired by a 1962 symposium at Yeshiva University featuring the three authors and will be held right here on Tuesday, November 16th. So mark your calendars and join us. Okay, and I promise no more NPL coming attractions after that one. We are thrilled to have renowned author and playwright Ayad Akhtar with us this evening. I would like to share some of what Ayad wrote when he accepted our invitation to speak. He acknowledged what he called Roth influences in Homeland Elegies. Then he added, he is the major one for me, thematically, stylishly, stylistically, tonally, linguistically. It is unfathomably moving to me to be invited to give this lecture as part of the opening of the Philip Roth Personal Library. And so here we are, eagerly awaiting Mr. Akhtar's lecture called Selected Affinities. Two things I am sure of, it will be brilliant and you will have questions. <laughs> As you can see on the program, we have scheduled a Q&A session after the talk that will be facilitated by our own library ambassador, Handel Destinville. So on your seat, you should notice, um, in addition to the, tonight's program, every sh everyone should have an index card. Do you have your index card? Yes, perfect. And a pencil. Please use those cards to jot down questions you may have for our guest lecturer. At the end of the lecture, staff members will collect them, and as time permits, we will try to get to them all. Mr. Akhtar has also graciously agreed to a book signing, so when the program ends, staff will set up the table, and guests can line up to have their items signed. And as always, there is an after lecture reception in the lobby, so guests are welcome to make their way to the lobby for some light refreshments, so I hope you'll join us. So now, I am pleased to introduce Julia Golier, who has been a good friend of the library, as she was to Philip Roth as well. Julia serves as literary executor of the Roth Estate and a psychiatrist specializing in the treatment of PTSD and traumatic stress. Julia, welcome. Let's give her a hand. Uh, thank you, Jocelyn and Rosemary and Kristen, and to everyone at the library. It's great to be here for the lecture, and it's so exciting once again to visit the very amazing and beautiful personal library. In 2017, Philip sent the following email. Because I am a son of Newark, the Newark Public Library has recently instituted a lecture series in my name. It's only 12 minutes to Newark by train and not much more by car. This library and its branches were a great stimulant to me as a boy, and I'd be delighted if you'd come sometime in the latter half of September and talk about the present American moment, which is so exuberantly made manifest in your new book. Yours, Philip. We know this because the recipient, Salman Rushdie, gave the lecture here because, as he said, quote, if Philip Roth writes to you to deliver the Philip Roth lecture, 
The correct answer to that question is yes. When he delivered it here in 2018, he was surrounded by more Newark police officers than I have ever seen at the library before or since. Words matter, and so do threats. Rishti said of Philip, quote, he was a writer through whose writing many American moments, past and present, can be explored and understood, and whose work, to use his phrase, has been a great stimulant to me and many writers of my generation and the generations following mine. Tonight, we are honored to welcome to the Newark Public Library a magnificent writer of the generation that followed, Mr. Ayad Akhtar. He has brilliantly captured the, president, the present American moment made manifest most recently in the novel Homeland Elegies and prior to that in American Dervish and in his plays, Junk, Disgraced, The Who and the What, and The Invisible Hand. He is the recipient of very many distinguished awards, all of which are outlined in this pamphlet on your chair, uh, including among them the Pulitzer Prize for Drama and an award in literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He also serves as the president of Penn America. I had the deep pleasure of reading his two novels over the summer. Homeland Elegies, as described in the book jacket, tells an epic story of longing and dispossession in the world that 9-11 made. Part family drama, part social essay, part picaresque novel. At its heart, it is a story of a father, a son, and a country they both call home. The story follows the characters through the heartland and coasts of America, as well as to Central Europe and the mountains of Afghanistan. Its reach covers the partition of India and Pakistan, the events of September 11, 2001, and the first election of Donald J. Trump. With its historical sweep and intersection of the personal, familial, and political, Homeland Elegy calls to mind, though they are worlds apart, Roth's American Pastoral and the rest of the trilogy. Insofar as we are gathered in Newark, it is worth noting some of the two authors' most obvious common concerns. Patrimony, belonging in America, anti-Semitism, the culture wars, and the importance of free speech and the post office. The connection of these two authors felt even more personal to me. Reading the author who peddled my 10-speed Schwinn past split level in two-story homes in the middle-class subdivision of Milwaukee, I sensed the presence of the boy who told stories of the Osborne Terrace Library, a mile or two from his house where he bicycled to as a boy every two weeks to borrow books and how he carried them home half a dozen at a time in the basket of his bicycle. Akhtar's autobiogra autobiographical novel reads like a memoir, so I confess I couldn't, couldn't help wondering what was true. Did I add Akhtar's physician father, who specialized in cardiac arrhythmias, really vote for Donald Trump? Did Akhtar become a virtual multimillionaire overnight thanks to the investments of a shady charismatic hedge fund manager? Did he really develop the telltale copper penny rash on his palms? And every time I had those thoughts, I heard Philip say to me, Julia, it doesn't matter. Read the story. Stick to the words on the page. And so I followed his orders as best I could, at least until I got to the outrageous story of Dr. Rex Dumacus a star athlete turned rogue cardiac surgeon. I couldn't stick to the page anymore. I had to Google him. <laughs> if you Google Rex Dumacus, it takes you, without any explanation, to a, to a Tallahassee-based vascular surgeon named Dr. Moses Desmond de Graft Johnson. While Moses once saved the life of rapper 50 Cent, who came to his trauma ward with, with multiple gunshot wounds, 
He subsequently performed hundreds of unnecessary angiographies on people in poor communities. He performed these procedures to the tune of $30 million in profit. He has since been investigated by the FBI, pled guilty to 56 counts of fraud, and faces up to 10 years in prison. So Google thinks they've figured it out. But honestly, Rex is better and badder than Ghanaian born Moses. And though my husband says this is too long and I should cut this out, I'm still going to tell you the story of Rex. <laughs> Quote, for 15 years, Dumakis had not only performed unnecessary procedures on his patients, he had also used those unnecessary procedures to harm them. Gaining access to their coronary arteries, he would go in with his catheter and intentionally abrade an area along the healthy arterial lining. This created a future site of plaque buildup and eventual heart disease, each such abrasion worth at least a half million dollars in billable follow-up for a decade to come. It was criminal conduct, of course, but it didn't come to light until after Chiro bought the practice, bought it in large part because of the extraordinary cash flow produced by these criminal activities." End quote. Dumakis' brilliant, ev brilliantly evil conduct only comes to light because of the actions of an affair with an OR nurse gone awry. Unlike Moses, however, Rex did not face prison time. You will need to read the novel, if you haven't already, to learn of his and his hospital's fate. The corporate, risk, the corporate risk management resolution is so palpably unconscionable, unconscionable that it rings distressingly and plausibly true. This story, coupled with that of the father's medical malpractice suit, which originated from his spending more than the allotted time with a patient captures the perverted incentives, priorities, and pressures of our healthcare system, the dangerous pursuit of extreme wealth, and the excesses of American capitalism. He made me see a side of America of which I had certainly been aware, but did not want to see in its ugly entirety. The same is true for his nuanced depictions of the complex relationship of America and the Muslim world. I can't begin to characterize the religious, political, and historical conflicts presented in his work. However, when over the summer, President Biden announced a full troop withdrawal from Afghanistan and seemingly misread the Taliban's determination, it took me immediately to a passage from Homeland Elegies that haunted me when I first read it. It is in the sub subsection entitled, The Abundant Idol Disp Despoiled. Quote, the abandonment of Afghanistan and the first war in Iraq sent a clear message. Whatever the Americans said meant nothing. Whatever they promised was a lie. If you paid in blood to help them manage their interests, they poured money down your throat and invited you to Washington to fly your shawls and headscarves like flags of freedom. When you tried to manage your own interests, then your Islam was backward, unruly, oppositional, an excuse to kill you. Warnings about American influence were nothing new for Muslims of the Levant and its eastern beyond, and some had long been advocating resistance, violent or otherwise. For many more, the first Gulf War was a moment of truth and gave fresh, decisive life to the old argument that the West's welcome was predatory, and the westernization could cost Muslims their land, their beliefs, and their lives. However, that is just one of many views presented. The narrator lives life as a Muslim, an American, a writer, a son of Pakistani-born physicians, a brotherless brother, a noter of dreams, and a man who has been both poor and rich. As such, his relationships to his religion, country, and homeland are full of contradictions, ambiguities, and inter interconnections, only further complicated 
by the defiling, by the quote, defiling of America as symbol enacted on that fateful Tuesday in September, end quote. He closes this chapter with, quote, the world looked to us, and now I speak as an American, to uphold a holy image or as holy as it gets in this age of enlightenment. We have been the earthly garden, the abundant idol, the productive Arcadia of the world's pastoral dream. Between our shores has gleamed a realm of refuge and renewal, in short, the only reliable escape from history itself. It's always been a myth, of course, and one destined for rupture sooner or later. Yet what an irony. When history finally caught up to us, it wasn't just we Americans, or even mainly we Americans, who would suffer the disastrous consequences. End quote. We have been the world's pastoral dream, he writes, not just America's. And with that, welcome to Newark, Mr. Akhtar. I meant it when uh, I wrote that this is an unfathomably uh, moving invitation, and uh, I'm choked up by that introduction. Thank you for that uh, remarkable introduction. Um, so I want to thank the selection committee for the invitation to address you all today. Philip Roth's work has been an important and formative influence in my own practice as a writer, so it's a particular thrill to be here in celebration of the opening of the Philip Roth Personal Library at the Newark Public Library. I will speak for about 45 minutes, at which time I will look forward to your questions. Finally, I want to thank Toronto-based poet Eva HD for a rich exchange of sources and thoughts which helped shape my remarks here today. I believe Eva's here today. <clears throat> Philip Roth's own descriptor for the focus of this annual lecture is American literature and history. But previous speakers have offered personal reflections on Roth's work and its relationship to their own. In trying to make some sense of what I might say that felt worthy in either respect about literature and history or about my relationship to Roth's work, I would eventually come to feel that perhaps neither was what was called for this year. Instead, I'm going to speak from a growing feeling that I have that something alarming is happening in the culture at large and which is increasingly reflected in the cultural thinking and production of our current era. The title of this talk is Selected Affinity, a play, of course, on elective affinity, an idea that runs from alchemy through Goethe and into the social sciences of the 19th century. The notion being of chemical elements or people or cultural forms that evince analogy and kinship, and which therefore enter into mutually arising relationship. In the case of today's title, selected affinity and not an elective one, because during this talk, this public thinking through, if you will, I will endeavor to wend my way to a proposition, namely that we are at the dawn of a new era in which our affinities are no longer the result of our own interest or tendencies, but are increasingly selected for us for the purpose of automated economic gain. The automation of our cognition and the predictive power of the technology to monetize our behavior, indeed our very thinking, is transforming not only our discourse with one another, transforming not only our societies, but our very neurochemistry. That this might be a welcome arrival of a wholesale digital corrective to the problems of the human condition is a thesis I largely reject. As I recall, Saul Bellow once said of writing novels, and I'm paraphrasing here, the challenge was to put his best ideas to the test and hope that those ideas failed. The optimizing rhetoric of our digital utopist billionaires has, alas, yet to be put to a litmus test as rigorous and resonant as the one Bellow lays out for literature. By the end of these remarks, I will have hoped to circle the question of just what sort of place a literature worthy of the name might have in this era of automation. Of course, it would be hard to proceed with this year's lecture without at least some acknowledgment 
of the controversy surrounding Blake Bailey and his recent biography of Philip Roth. As a board member of PEN America for six years now and its current president, the situation surrounding Norton's decision to suspend promotion and later publication of the book was the subject of much con conversation internally at Penn. What I found surprising about this situation was the lack of any entreaty, private or otherwise, from the publisher to defend so-called freedom of speech. It's not unusual for Penn to hear from publishers during dust-ups like these and to ask for support at least when such a defense serves their interests. Let me be clear, I am not defending Blake Bailey or his book or its quality or its right to be. I am also not contesting the right of a publisher to make whatever decision it deems necessary. But the evident lack of any concern for principle, whether that principle was for Norton to do their due diligence when confronted with credible accusations against an author they had under contract, or on the other hand, the principle of freedom of speech, this evident lack of concern for anything but commercial prospects and corporate liability, well, it certainly sheds some light for me on why calls for Penn to speak out on behalf of publishers have started to ring hollow. There is a larger story here about the deeper incursion of mercantile thinking into the groundwater of our most defining philosophical ideas. As such, this matter does dovetail with some of my thinking to follow. It should not have come as a surprise that Philip Roth was probably not the best judge of character, whether in the matter of choosing his own biographer or perhaps in the matter of anyone else. In a particularly evocative articulation of Zucker Zuckerman's Poetics of Living, Roth writes in American Pastoral, getting people wrong is not what living is about anyway. Getting, sorry, getting people right is not what living is all about anyway. It's getting them wrong that is living, getting them wrong and wrong and wrong, and then on careful reconsideration, getting them wrong again. That's how we know we're alive. A joyfully erring judge of character then, at least on the page, and likely beyond it. But then again, we don't come to Roth's work for its judiciousness. It's formal brio, it's vital coursing energy, it's infectious intellectual static. It's sublime fusion of the personal and political, and above all, perhaps, the whiplash swing and staggering beauty of the American language as it flows into us from his pages. Yes, all of this is why we read Roth and read him over and over and over. Judiciousness, probably not. But then again, it's unlikely anyone would make a serious case for the artist as judge. For while we expect an artist to shape stirring, hopefully profound depictions of our prevailing moral questions, we don't expect an artist to pronounce final judgment on such things. There may be an art to writing a convincing dissenting opinion or a fine amicus brief, but no one would confuse the authors of either with an artist. In much of what came up around the publication of Bailey's biography and the controversy that resulted, some saw an affinity between Bailey's credibly alleged sexual predations, and what some saw as his biographical subject's puerile sexuality. Throughout all of this, a certain kind of, let us call it, moral stridency was front and center. Some bemoaned a stunted moral sense in Roth that prevented him not only from choosing the right biographer for the job, but limited the greatness and ultimate, ultimate relatability of his work. One important young contemporary writer commented in a tweet later deleted that the masculine cult of the ego had held Roth in its grip and that Roth would have been a much greater writer had he done more work to loosen that grip. Others rushed to defend Roth and his work against what they called a new Puritanism, reminding those willing to listen that yesterday's moral heroes are often tomorrow's villains. Strident clarity in one's moral vision of the world is no guarantee that one will be able to write great sentences or craft indelible scenes. Moral certainty of this sort offers no edge in seeing a picture of the world that is dramatically or lyrically compelling. Indeed, certainty of this sort is no real advantage to understanding at all. Knowledge of the world or of nature or of people is not aided by a foremost commitment to purity in one's moral approach. If anything, moral purity is only a liability in that regard, splitting the world into acceptable and, in, and unacceptable 
defensible and indefensible. It impoverishes the artist's access to and ultimate knowledge of reality, rich and roiling as it is. And yet, to leave it at that would be misleading. We live in an era of either ors. This matter, like everything, is considerably more complicated. One of our most brilliant literary minds, Vivian Gornick, suggests, and I quote her here, in the end, a writer survives only if there's wisdom in their work. A hundred years later, a reader must recognize the emotional patterns as their own, no matter what the social circumstances of the writer was, end quote. It's my belief that Gornick is describing something true here, not just one of many equally valid points of view, that what moves us and keeps us reading Plato or Chaucer or Shakespeare or George Eliot is recognition, recognition of patterns still resonant across the great expanse of centuries. Our patterns of power, of longing, of suffering, of loving, losing, the patterns of our great struggles to understand, to live rightly, to know the good. So yes, it would be silly to deny the centrality of moral inquiry of moral questions to the artistic impulse. In Gornick's view, what endures in literature, what makes work great, is what she calls wisdom, and which she defines as occasioning recognition. Recognition in Old English, geknauen, from which we derive kno or no in our modern tongue. So Gornick and the etymology both suggest that wisdom arises from recognition, which is a kind of knowing. It seems to me that perhaps the most wide-ranging and disturbing development in our contemporary collective life is the new preponderance of a practice derived from digital technology which treats knowledge and information as synonymous. For while the way to wisdom leads through knowledge, there is no path to wisdom from information. In our lives today, we are subject to a dominion of endless digital surveillance. To note this fact is not to break any news. And yet the sheer scale of the domination continues to defy our imaginative embrace. Virtually everything we do, everything we are, is transmuted now into digital information. Our movements in space, our breathing at night, our expenditures and viewing habits, our internet searches, our conversations in the kitchen and in the bedroom, all of it, all of it observed by no one in particular, all of it reduce, reduced to data parsed for the patterns that will predict our purchases. But the model isn't simply predictive. It is also influencing. Daniel Kahneman's important work in behavioral psychology has demonstrated the effectiveness of unconscious priming. Whether you are aware that, or not that you've seen a word, that word affects your decision making. This is the reason that the technology works so effectively. The regime of screens that increasingly comprises the surface area of our daily cognition operates as a delivery system for unconscious priming. The website banners, the promotion tabs in your Gmail, the Instagram story you swipe through, the brand names glanced in email headings, the words and images insinuated between posts and feeds of various sorts. A brief list, otherwise known as advertising technology or ad tech for short. The ads we don't particularly pay attention to shape us more than we know. An array of sensory and meaning stimuli barely strong enough to hold our attention, yet working at every moment to adhere us to the platforms. Adhesiveness. That's what the technology aspires to achieve, and it's the metric by which it self-regulates and optimizes. The longer we adhere, the longer we stick around in a show on YouTube or Facebook, on the New York Times app, the deeper we scroll, the more times we touch our screen, the greater the yield of information, the more effective the influence. We are only starting to understand just how intentional all of this has become just how engineered for maximum engagement the platforms are. In fact, the platforms have been built and are being continually honed to keep us glued, to keep us engaged. Merchants of attention have learned that nothing adheres us to their attention traps like emotion. 
and that some emotions are stickier than others, the new and alluring, the surpassingly cute, the frenzied thrill at the prospect of conflict or violence, the misfortune of others, perhaps most emblematically, the expression of our anger, rightful or hateful. All of this lights up a part of our brain that will not release us from its tyranny. Our fingertips seek it. To say that we are addicts is not even to measure the magnitude of what is actually happening. The system is built to keep us engaged, to keep that neurochemical leak of dopamine steadily coursing, and it operates with a premium on efficiency, which is to say the platforms optimize for performance based on empirical feedback. An early architect of the ad tech model writes that the largest monolingual dictionary in the world, the Worden Book of the Dutch language with over 430,000 entries, is dwarfed by the size of the keyword lists maintained by search engine marketers. Like a stock portfolio manager who keeps a set of assets with current prices, the search engine maintains encyclopedic word lists along with dollar sign values and constantly adjusts bids to reflect realized performance and demand. Briefly, if you are a divorce lawyer, say in Reno, Nevada, looking to have your link show up on the results page when someone is looking for a divorce lawyer in Reno, a few of the options that you have here, keyword search divorce lawyer in Reno, the cost per click to you is $1.45, the resulting revenue will be 90 cents. Nevada cheap divorce as a variation on that search, cost per click 75 cents, revenue per click $1.10. Another possible search, Nevada divorce lawyer, cost per click $5.55, revenue per click $2.75. Infinite, infinite scrolls of variations, all marked with prices. The most expensive word in the English language? Mesothelioma. A decade ago, attorneys seeking damages and making fortunes on contingency fees bid up the value of this word as high as $90 a click. It would be hard to print money faster than these ad tech auction markets can make it. Part of what this process reveals is the persistent self-regulating nature of the technology. And like a virus needing a healthy sampling of the population in order to spawn variations, for the tech to be able to tailor and deliver advertising in its various forms, it needs eyeballs. The more of them and the longer they stay, the greater the opportunity. John Stanky, current CEO of AT&T, was unusually clear about this prime directive in 2018 as he addressed his new employees at the then just acquired HBO. I quote him here from the New York Times. We need hours a day, Mr. Stanky said, referring to the time viewers spend watching HBO programs. It's not hours a week. It's not hours a month. We need hours a day. You are competing with devices that sit in people's hands that capture their attention every 15 minutes. This, mind you, was 2018. Continuing the theme, Stanky added, I want more hours of engagement. Why are more hours of engagement important? Because you get more data and information about a customer that then allows you to do things like monetize through advertising and subscription. But even this model of an elementary attention trap if you will, doesn't begin to express the active vanguard of today's engagement technology. Platforms churning through content with the greatest velocity have the ability to shape the emotional responses of consumers almost in real time. Watch a video on YouTube or like a post on Facebook or Twitter, and you will be offered another and another and another. Behind the suggested offerings is a logic of emotional response. The platform is seeking your trigger. Nothing drives engagement like outrage, moral outrage, those we know it right to hate, those we love because we are united together against those we know are right to hate. This is the logic behind the viral campaigns leading to the historic slaughter of the Rohingya in Myanmar. This is the logic of the increasingly truculent divide between right and left in this country today. 
Driven by engagement and the profit that it generates, each side is pushed further and further from the other as the space between them becomes more and more charged, richer with opportunities for the platforms to monetize it. I have often thought of late that it would do us some good to recognize what we take for a clash in ideologies might have more electrical engineering behind it than we realize. Engagement technology isn't just shaping the world without, but remaking the world within. In attempting the sketch that follows of this technology's damage to contemporary interiority, I will do my best not to play the part of the Luddite. For to do so would be to imply that I believed an alternative was possible. I don't think it is. We have finally arrived at a long imagined end. For more than a generation, science fiction writers and aficionados have speculated about the possibility and imminence of the singularity. That is, the moment when AI will finally eclipse human intelligence. To many, it's meant the robot capable of thinking, with an intellect surpassing our own. Let me suggest that digital problem solving has already surpassed human capacity. Indeed, our advanced societies are increasingly ordered by a digital matrix of data collection, pattern recognition, and decision making that we cannot even begin to fathom, and which is happening in every single successive millisecond after millisecond. The synergy of data technology, computer processing speeds and capacity, and an almost frictionless non-local interconnectivity, all of it enables exchange, delivery of services, production of goods, growth of capital, and most centrally, the endless catalog of our every interface, however glancing, however indirect, with this system's sprawling and ubiquitous apparatus. The singularity is here. We could call it the era of automation. And its inescapable imprint on our inner lives is already apparent. In pursuit of what John Stanky called more hours every day, the technology meets out its steady stream of tiny pleasures as a reward for your sustained attention. Touch the screen or controller, respond to the offered stimuli like a rat in an experiment, receive what some are now calling a dopamine rush. What follows from this engagement with the devices is an education in which the system absorbs our responses and in absorbing begins to shape them. The fetishizing modality of the human unconscious, until now ever elusive, is endowed with ordinal form. As the technology channels the nebulous pull of our proverbial id with Cartesian clarity, the movements of our desire rerouted toward the system's mercantile ends. This careful, unceasing, inhumanly methodical curation of our pleasure principle becomes a larger force in our psyches as the devices securing our access to the steady diet of stimulation now become prosthetic extensions of our cognition. We may not notice that there is less and less time passing between the touches of our phone. Every 15 minutes, that was so 2018. We're in 2021 and the urge to reach out for the screen now feels like a rightful impatience with boredom of any sort. But it isn't that, it's withdrawal. And from this endlessly recurring neurochemical deficit is born a sense of circumstance and a syllogism that goes something like this. Something is wrong if nothing is happening. Something is always happening on this screen. Nothing is wrong when I am on this screen. The habit of succumbing to the syllogism daily, hourly, every minute, charts a course into an undiscovered country of distrust. Distrust of interior discomfort, whatever its texture, anxiety and uncertainty on the one hand, boredom on the other. Embedded in this scheme of endless distraction is a deeper logic. The system has come to understand the fundamental value of always reaffirming our points of view back to us, delivering to us a world in our image, confirmation bias as the default setting. This is the real meaning of contemporary virtuality, for in the virtual space, 
the technology combats and corrects our frustrations with reality itself. Reality, which defies expectation and understanding by definition. I seek, I find what I know, I enjoy this recognition of myself. I am trained over time to trust in a path to understanding that leads through the familiar, that leads through me. I am the arbiter of what is true. I am the arbiter of what is real. What is more real than me? In its basest form, and make no mistake, the baser the form, the stickier the engagement. In its basest form, what we're describing here is a profound technological support for enthrallment to primary narcissism. We don't need to know our Ovid in order to understand the perils of all this self-gazing. And yet, we may nevertheless fail to appreciate just how pervasive the social attitudes engendered by this orientation have become. Self-obsession as a route to self-realization is, of course, not a new discourse. American advertising has been foisting this fiction on us for quite some time exalting attention paid to even the most fugitive of our desires, encouraging us to think of the fulfillment of desire itself, however trivial, as the ultimate purpose of our national politics. So no, the message isn't new, but the breadth of the messaging is unprecedented. The technology now floods the zone, the waters never recede, and in the process, the landscape and its use are entirely remade. Now, the affirming predicate of bias confirmation reigns supreme. I know is a social prime mover. Elevation of the I that knows is a greater social good. Exhibitionist displays of self-esteem are conflated with instances of political defiance. The self-valorizing anthems, the elevation of me and my to epistemological categories and the now widespread misreading of the self's fragility as resulting not from the contingent situation of selfhood itself, but from society's failure and neglect to protect and recognize me. Accustomed to the pleasures of digital approbation, absorbed and convinced by a moralizing rhetoric that passes off our dependence on technology as righteous activism, we internalize another pernicious untruth, deeply damaging to our social fabric. Namely, that the path to rede redemption and change will be paved by personal pleasure. Pleasure we come to feel we shouldn't have to suffer even a moment's discomfort to enjoy. To use a beloved locution borrowed from the lexicon of contemporary self-esteem culture, we deserve this pleasure because we deserve better. We deserve to feel good. All of this points to the very beginning of a new social ontology, which we have in fact only barely sketched here, an evolving set of behaviors guided by the shift in incentives the technology has created. The glue is pleasure, the purpose is sales. It's the advertising model of thought, the entertainment model of consciousness. Self-promotion, self-commodification, self-marketing, all are now increasingly taken for legitimate forms of commentary and critique. Ceaseless affirmation of our biases emboldens the strident certainty of our beliefs, moral and otherwise. This is the complexion of public exchange in a newly shaped public sphere where the regime of screens afflicting our cognition has enshrined the centrality of certainty. Here, ideas have no inhering value, but operate as bait for the hours a day of human attention at stake. Yet another demonstration of just how much the technology is reshaping our relations with one another. In fact, we are increasingly little more than grist for a monetizing mill that mixes like cattle feed ground from cattle bones, our own deepest intimacies with the system's digital slop, feeding it back to us wholesale. In the process, we are being remade by what we consume. In the words of Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, quote, 
I do. <clears throat> I notice what I find increasingly troubling, a cold-blooded grasping, a hunger to take and take but never to give, an ease with dishonesty and selfishness that is couched in the language of self-care, an expectation always to be helped and rewarded no matter whether deserving or not, an astonishing level of self-absorption, an unrealistic puritanism from others, an overinflated sense of ability or talent when there is any, an inability to apologize without justification, a passionate performance of virtue well executed in the public digital space, but not in the intimate space of friendship. Stirring words. I doubt anyone will fail to see some truth in what she's saying, but perhaps even more disturbing than the pain behind this passionate indictment is the predicament of those who occasioned it, the rest of us. For who, if they're truly honest, would dare to think they'd somehow escaped? Who among us has not succumbed to the selection of our affinities? Vivian Gornick suggests that wisdom is what causes a work of literature to endure. <clears throat> Wisdom, a kind of knowing, a movement from insight to something higher, larger, deeper. In fact, the spatial metaphors falter on the shoals of paradox, perhaps inevitable for any attempt to take the full measure of wisdom's compass, the brightening of vision or the loss of it into a darker seeing of more infinite depth. None of this, however, suggests anything like a path of certainty moral or otherwise, leading to the kind of wisdom Gornick is talking about. Indeed, certainty has little to do with wisdom at all. Might, in fact, be something closer to wisdom's opposite. For wisdom is a form of knowing intimate with the inevitability of uncertainty. Uncertainty, which is the very discomfort that the technologically curated cascade of confirmation bias is working to undo in us second after second. But the wisdom of literature does not arise from the certain or the pure, nor does it aspire to either. There is no ordained path to it, no studied or sanctioned route. If literature can occasion a different order of seeing all around a thing down to its center or a seeing as broad as the world itself, if this is what literature can do, it is not by means of an electrically engineered moral code. There is no blueprint, no forbidden terrain, for indeed any road from anywhere can lead to literature and the wisdom that causes it to endure. For a writer, elective affinity is the lamp that lights the way. It was ever so for Philip Roth, a writer of passionate affinities, if there ever was one. Affinities he felt toward the great American writers, even at a time when the prevailing social thinking imagined him as Jewish first and American second, if at all. And an affinity that led to his embrace of even a virulent anti-Semite like Celine. Quote, Celine is my Proust, Philip Roth once wrote, even if his anti-Semitism made him an abject person. To read him, I suspend my Jewish conscience. Celine is a great liberator, end quote. The path of elective affinity almost always leads to contradiction, like that of an American Jewish novelist emulating an anti-Semite. Contradiction which, if Fitzgerald is right, would be another, another form of wisdom. For in Fitzgerald's famous words, it's the ability to hold opposing thoughts that defines any fine mind. In Benjamin Taylor's Here We Are, a touching account of his friendship with Philip Roth, Taylor writes of Roth reading aloud to him a passage in Conrad's Lord Jim. Quote, a man that is born falls into a dream like one who falls into the sea. If he tries to climb out into the air as inexperienced people endeavor to do, he drowns. The way is to the destructive element, submit yourself. And with the exertions of your hands and feet in the water, make the deep, deep sea keep you up. 
in the destructive element immerse. And Roth looks up and adds, it's what I've said to myself in art and woe is me in life too. Submit to the deeps, let them buoy you up. The downward movement that lifts or the ascent that sinks slowly as a kite, as Elizabeth Hardwick writes in Sleepless Nights. The paths to wisdom, the paths to the wisdom of contradiction are legion, which is why any artist with a nose for a possible route alive to her own affinities will not ultimately be bucked by the concerns of the many. For something else that the technology has done is to enable a collective voice, a gathering place for our various camps of confirmed bias. These agglomerations of outrage are not just left-leaning or right-leaning, grouping superintended by algorithmically collated slogans of belonging, group creedal statements honed like party platforms to the very locution. One of the characteristics of the automating technology is that it is very effective at hurting opinion in ways not meaningfully different from policing it. And so it is that the singularity now operates as its own form of an ever-present central committee. No flesh and blood party censor is even required. The writer today, wherever she is, must not be cowed by fear, however real, of opprobrium, retaliation, and group exclusion. She must know that her path to the transmutation of knowledge which produces the wisdom of literature can, in the end, only lead from her own sense of things. The singularity will not lead her there, not in the form of the information masquerading as a kind of knowing, nor in the redeeming passions of the metaphysics of group belonging. No, and any defense of the path to literature, to the writing of it, to the reading of it, to the teaching of it, any such defense can only be as strong as those willing to heed it. For fundamentally, this is not a matter of judgment, not for a court of public opinion or of any other sort. It is a matter of the heart, a matter of that wisdom that we call love. I will end today with a quote from Roth's address to the audience on his winning the National Book Award for Goodbye Columbus. Having recently read about a symposium at the Iowa workshop where leading novelists of the day were canvassed about the condition and function of the writer in contemporary American society, Roth commented, quote, should the writer, can the writers, is it the function of the writer in contemporary baloney? What questions? What a lightweight approach to human character. Imagine. Should Jane Austen, Ken Thomas Hardy, is it the function of Sir Walter Scott? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oktar. That was brilliant and a pleasure to hear. I'd like to introduce Handel Destinville, a friend of the library who's, we're going to collect her questions and he's going to present them to Mr. Oktar. I have the pleasure of being uh, the liaison of the collective mind of the audience and to you. Um, so to begin, uh, the first question is, what you described is overwhelming. Um, what would you suggest we do to start avoiding the distortion to our thinking by this digital world? I mean, that's the central question. Um, I said I didn't want to offer my remarks in the spirit of the doddering Luddite who believed that there was an old way that was better. 
the science is starting to be pretty clear about the differences in cognitive function related to things as simple as reading on a page versus reading a screen or writing with a pen and pencil on a real piece of paper versus typing. I mean, all of those things are starting to accumulate. Vaclav Havel, the famous um, Czech playwright, well, he was famous because he became a president. <laughs> it's an unusual trajectory in which a playwright becomes a president, um, became the president of the Czech Republic, had a, um, he had a, an analysis of the, the difficulty of living in the communist regime. He said that, that, that the challenge was not to succumb to the lie. We are overwhelmed by a lie. It is a mercantile lie. It's not, a, um, it's not an obvious political lie, but it has political ramifications. Havel's remedy was to live in the truth of daily life that as the system begins to flood our private experience with its version of the public sphere, we have to try to live in the truth of our daily lives. And that for some people may mean less time on their phones and whatnot. But the problem is, is that even if you disconnect, the world around you isn't. And so it's not about it putting you at a disadvantage, it's about the fact that the digital matrix that's making all of those decisions, it's making those decisions whether you're participating or not. I think what the consequences of this are and the political resistance or maybe the utopists have a point, I don't believe they do, but it will be the central question along with climate change and I think the two are connected of, of the following generations. This will be the question. And to step back for a moment, um, was the title of your talk today influenced by, and I apologize, Goff's elective affinita? Goethe. 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 Yes. Uh, Goethe wrote a famous novel called Elective Affinities, uh, which was a kind of experiment, um, one of the great 19th century, um, one of the great novels in German literature. Um, and the idea came from alchemy, uh, as I said earlier. Um, the notion that there is a natural or in there there's a natural election that happens between you know it's like when you meet somebody who you you just feel like you've known your whole life and then you end up getting married and have a wonderful time it's a wonderful story and it doesn't happen that often but whatever it does it's happened to me <laughs> um elective affinity that there are um similarities or interests interests that converge that create so it's this sense of somehow obeying the voice, the inner voice, if you will. Thank you. And uh, another question similar. Uh, what, which Roth novel had the greatest impact on your, on your growth as a writer? I don't know how honestly I want to answer that question. <laughs> Um, I, I, you know, I had a dream a few nights ago about Philip Roth. He was, um, I'd never dreamt of him before. And I dreamt that he was, um, there was a sound, he was in the basement. And he was incredibly vital and youthful. And he came up the stairs and he reached out his hand and shook my hand and sort of patted me on the back. I don't know why I'm telling that story, maybe to avoid answering your question. <laughs> um, I think that the, I think the, the mid-late work, you know, is, I think the, the trilogy is one of the great works of American literature, one of the 10 great works of American literature. So it would be hard to argue, but, but there's so many things about so many of the books that I have struggled with and, and fought against and despaired because I thought it would never be possible to surpass. And, I have a very intimate relationship with Roth where I often read him and think, well, he got it wrong and I'm gonna get it right. Um, and of course, it's silly, but I gotta keep going. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Great answer, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as a writer, uh, what do you write knowing the mercantilizing of your reader's inner life and attention? <laughs> yeah, exactly, that's the question. I mean. 
I think I tried, uh, you know, the beautiful introduction um, that was read about, you know, um, about my work, I suppose, you know, sort of begins to, to point the way a bit to how I think awakening the moral conscience of the reader, not, not to instill in the reader ideas that I have, but to awaken them to what, to the question of what really our, our world, our society, our country, what is the higher good? What is the, it, we don't seem to have a definition anymore, a working definition of a collective good. And I think that one of Roth's great themes is the construction or creation of the self out of the societal situation. Um, and I think showing that process and showing that the societies that we allow to come into being or that we participate, that they create, they create our interiority, which is of course what I'm trying to articulate here is that we are in the process of allowing the technology driven by profit incentive to shape our reality, our internal reality. We're not gonna come back from this unless we, well, I, I, would, I might just say we're not gonna come back from this. And maybe you all have to just deal, and I have to deal with that reality. And perhaps dealing with the starkness of that reality can create some kind of a passion to do something about it. It's probably easier to just pick up your phone and check your email. And a uh, little, little closer to you, um, was it your intent to write a memoir with Homeland Elegies? And also, the writer says, I love the book. The writer says what? I love the book, in addition to the question oh. they wanted is known. Thank you. And I will share <laughs> that as well. Thank you. Um, I felt that I wanted to address my fellow Americans at a moment when our politics seemed to be unfathomable. And it seemed to be that the fracturing of the collective we was underway to, a, to an extent that perhaps it was an act of artistic idealism, but I thought, could I summon a voice? Could I use the lyric mode to summon a voice that would unify the public, at least the public that read the book, no matter what your background, whether you're whatever, wherever you're from, whatever your experience is, as an American, can we all still say we in an experience, in a portrait of our country together, even if it's at times a dark portrait? So that was the impulse. I knew that I would have to use my own life to paint that portrait to paint that portrait. <clears throat> I was also, you know, I, I hate to say this, but it's true, Trump was the spiritual muse for the book in the sense that this entertainment model of consciousness that I'm talking about, he is the perfect embodiment of that. It's what's become of our reality, it's what's become of our politics. It's not that our ideas suck, it's that we don't have ideas. How to write a book about ideas, that was a, an entertainment in which the audience never knew, the reader never knew what was real and what wasn't. Mr. Trump has often said of himself that he is, quote, the king of debt. Nobody loves debt more than him. So he says it often. And it seems to me that the gap between perceived value and real value in debt is the same gap between appearance and reality and the same gap between meaning and nonsense in that respect. And so Trump again, you know, there's that wonderful idea in French painting, Trump Loy, tricking the eye. I wanted to trick the reader's eye into succumbing to this lust for unreality that has engulfed us all.
Now, building on that, one of the phrases during uh, your, your wonderful talk that stood out was uh, the wisdom of literature. And um, I just wanted to know if, uh, if you could expand on that, what that means for you. I had a teacher who changed my life. I was 15. My parents were both doctors. I was the eldest son of the two eldest kids in their families, the first to leave Pakistan, they were. They'd come here and they'd had a son, the first to be born on either side of the family. A lot of pressure. My mom instructed me from a very early age to respond to the question of what I wanted to be when I grew up, that I should say I want to be a neurologist. I was five, and I was repeating that I wanted <laughs> to be a neurologist. I didn't quite know what that meant, but I knew it had something, it was something good. <laughs> and then when I was 15, I had a teacher who changed my life. She was a teacher of world literature. Her name was Diane Durfler. And we read a story in the first class of hers, Durin Mott's The Tunnel, and she just opened it up. She explained the meaning of life as this writer saw it. I had never had that experience. And I walked out of class that day and I thought, oh, this is the greatest thing you could do with your life is to explore the question of what life could possibly mean through stories. I never questioned my vocation, my, I, nothing. I never questioned it since. I've had lots of trials and tribulations, but none of them have entailed wondering whether I should be a writer. I've suffered a lot. I've been fortunate and had some wonderful success too. But the thing that's remained steady through it all is the love that I felt that first day in lit class with Diane Durfler that has never left me. So the wisdom of literature to me encapsulates, Aristotle describes man, humans, the species, as the creature, the animal who wishes to know. That hunger to know is something that I think is the deepest pleasure when it is sated in the right way, when it is sated with a kind of subtlety and an expansiveness. There is no greater pleasure. Art as it, at its best, to me, is about absorption into a different order of being. And that absorption, again, is an experience that doesn't need justification. It's self-evident. It feels to me, when I have that experience, that it's the reason I'm here. And I think I'm not alone in feeling that. I think when people are touched by profound work and they see, as Vivian Gornick says, the deeper emotional patterns, that there's a sense of knowing, of meaning, that responds to the question of, what am I doing? What is this all about? Oh, the best question of all. Okay. Uh, what role do you think uh, public libraries public libraries can play in uh, guiding people towards self-knowledge and wisdom, particularly the New York Public Library. <laughs> <laughs> well, the New York Public Library should start by not inviting me to come and address <laughs> technology. I mean, I love libraries. I spent so much of my childhood in libraries and college I, in libraries. I, I am saddened by what is happening to libraries. And I think um, as, as libraries pivot into communal spaces that are no longer about reading and knowledge, that as libraries pivot into communal spaces that are about getting information, that we are losing an important resource for ourselves and our communities. What's the remedy? I don't know. Maybe the artist's role tonight in Newark on November 4th, between 6.30 and 7.45, was to sound an alarm 
to raise a question. Perhaps the rightful response is for those who have been here and heard it to either dismiss it or wonder what it means for them. I am not sanguine about where we're headed. And I think that it would do us some good, all of us, to recognize the darkness that may be ahead. And um, this is more of a comment than a question. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you again for your gracious answers and your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I share the sentiment of being overwhelmed. Uh, good evening, thank you. I'm Lauren Wells, I'm the president of the Newark Public Library Board. Um, and I think you were on the Zoom with my therapist the other day <laughs> because we had this conversation literally yesterday about my feelings about the world that we're living in. We just went through another election cycle um, and I had to turn off the TV because your talk framed this in terms of iPhones, internet, but the news and the media, right, are also a part of this. And so I'm watching all of this on CNN and I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm on The Running Man, Blade Runner, and The Matrix all at the same time, right? Because it's this gigantic project that is fundamentally about doing what you have said, programming us to relate to each other in specific ways, to relate to products in specific ways, to believe that a certain type of social organization is the organization that we need to exist and to survive on this planet. And so as I was just sort of processing with her what I started on November 1st, which was a month of austerity, no spending, all social media shut down, um, increased meditation, increased yoga, decreased conversations with anyone that wasn't essential. So you all are very essential because I'm here tonight. Um, I can't help but to be very grateful for your remarks um, and to be also very challenged by them because I think the questions of where do we go, how do we get there, what are we going to do, what are our individual roles, what are our collective roles, what are our institutional roles, what's our moral responsibility, what's our political responsibility, all of these questions are a part of your talk and they're also very much a part of your book. Um, and as Julia was opening, I circled the same passages that you did as they jumped out at me. I haven't gotten all the way through. Um, and the passage that resonates with me as I reflect on your talk is the second passage that Julia read that brought out the reality of the myth, right? And the myth of the story that has been almost, that has been masterfully constructed of what America is, who it is, the collective good, um, and what it is we aspire to be, who we welcome, who we exclude, all of those things. And so as I think about your talk, I think about the role of this invisible, yet visible sort of machine that is in technology in propagating this myth and in furthering the rupture. I think in many ways what has happened, um, I do see a little difference is, is that the rupture has been more exposed, right? That this duality of belonging, of norm versus other is a part of the history of this land that we stand on, right, that was occupied by Lenape Indians who lived here before anyone came to Newark. And for the most part, unless 
you know that history, that's not a story that's told. That's a story that's excluded. And this machine that's created around information that's aligned with the myth of the story that's been told that's sitting in this era where we can't talk about critical race theory, right? Where books are being banned all over this country in schools. I wonder what the role of what you shared with us tonight, how it plays out in perpetuating, propagating, furthering, deepening, ensuring the divisions are there so that what has been created can metastasize, to use a word, um, and to grow. Your, your point about the brain, I'm an educator, um, and for many years I've been challenging the use of phones in schools, iPads, um, curriculum on computers because of exactly what you've said. And so I think maybe in some ways part of the solution is what we're doing in school, right? Content-wise, because literature is stories, other people's stories that we may or may not have the opportunity to be exposed to so we're not disconnected from each other, but so that we have that opportunity to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, to hear their story, to feel their emotions, to see their experiences. Maybe part of it is taking the telephone out of the children's hands, taking it out of integrating it into curriculum, which is actually um, you know, something that happens now. How can you use the phone um, to, to make learning happen in a classroom um, and having students engaged in group work, talking to each other. We've been on Zoom, right, for almost two years now. I don't know, I've been on Zoom. I'm sure many of you have also been on Zoom. And there's a level of this, I, I have felt out of body experience very often in getting off of Zoom, Zoom and figuring out how to reconnect in the living space and not the virtual space. So I think that being very mindful about how we move back in our business practices. We were talking um, in the back before we came about how some companies, the pace of coming back, how much they're going to return to Newark after January, how much of their staff is going to be in the buildings. Maybe if we want to be a society that actually has a clear understanding of a collective good that includes everyone here, we will think about the things that you've raised here for us tonight in very serious ways and not just think about them in ways that increase our efficiency and our bottom line. I mean, there's so much that you said and there's so much that I can say, um, but I am just moved by the way in which you encapsulated the reality of our addiction <laughs> to technology, right, to misinformation even, um, and the ways in which our ability to discern the difference between what is knowledge, what is information, is being stripped away from us methodically and intentionally. Um, and so again, as an educator, I think the only way to combat that at a macro level is to really, really think about what we're doing in schools, which could be why it's such a hot topic right now, right? Why all over the country you have people um, showing up at board meetings, uh, standing outside of schools, challenging all kinds of things, because we ultimately know that at the end of the day, everything that our brain scans, right? There, I don't know how many bits of information it is that our brains absorb in a second, but it is beyond what I can count with my fingers, that we're taking it all in, and that that unconscious is what is driving our behavior, behavior more times than our conscience is. So it's just, um, it, it, it was very powerful. Your book um, is very powerful. 
Um, I like the mom. I don't know if that's your mom, but she's my girl. Um, and I would like to have drinks with her because she seems very wise and she seems like she's read lots of books. So thank you, Mr. Akhtar, for joining us here at the Newark Public Library for the first um, live Philip Roth lecture in a year and a half, maybe almost two years. And thank all of you. I don't know, is someone coming after me or am I just shutting it down? Oh, so I'm totally shutting it down. So I want to thank all of you as well for taking time out of your evening to come here and join us at the library. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to have you in our beautiful library. I would like to say that we're doing a good job. I wrote it down. What did I, where's my note? My first card that we are still acknowledged a library of reading. We have book clubs, we have kids in here reading, we have our mayor in here reading. We understand what our mission is and we understand that if we are not engaging people in stories that touch the matter of the heart, that what it is we really need and want collectively can never evolve. So thank you all for taking time to be here with us.